We hear a lot of perspectives on the Mankind Podcast. Inclusion of a guest is not an endorsement of their views, and the opinions expressed here do not always represent the mission or values of the Mankind Project USA. This is Naomi Way. You're listening to the Mankind Podcast. I've also read journals of boys who've committed suicide, and they, they talk explicitly about the, lo- the loss of friendships and the feeling like they'll never find someone who really understands them. Um, but you just see the whole trajectory of how, you know, masculinity and the pressure to man up uh, really, really hurts boys. The solution is to, to male violence, and to all sorts of problems, and is to helping young men and men have the relationships that they're starving for. Looks like the rain has gone. Welcome to the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the molds of modern manhood to prove to you that there is more than just one way to be a man. I'm your host, Brandon Clift, and today's episode is all about how you can help save the lives of boys and men through connection. Now, on May 23rd, 2014, the community of Isla Vista and the uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara were rocked when 22-year-old Elliot Roger killed six people, injured 14 others before killing himself. Now, in Elliot's 137-page manifesto titled My Twisted World, he recounts his life starting with an idyllic childhood, which leads to a painful teenage experience. Now, the manifesto's opening paragraph, interestingly, speaks immediately to what today's guest, Dr. Niobe Way, calls the crisis of connection. And it reads, Humanity. All of my suffering in this world has been at the hands of humanity, particularly women. It has made me realize just how brutal and twisted humanity is as a species. All I ever wanted was to fit in and live a happy life amongst humanity. But I was cast out and rejected forced to endure an existence of loneliness and insignificance, all because the females of the human species were incapable of seeing value in me. Now, it's clear, to me at least, that through Eliot's words, that here was a young man who was in serious pain. Now, there is no way that we can, you know, that his actions can be justified, but just through looking deeper into the, the lead up to Elliot's actions, we can gain some insights into the kind of formula that causes young boys and men who, even with an idyllic childhood, can still be drawn to horrific acts such as suicide, and in Elliot's case, unfortunately, a whole lot worse. Now, before we do that, though, let's address a problem. You see, we as a society, we want to be able to explain everything we see and read. You know, we seem to be very uncomfortable with any ideas of gray area. And this causes a lot of us to, uh, to, to basically label things that we see. For example, when I was researching uh, Elliot's story, uh, you know, through videos, through a lot of comment sections, you would see people, you know, calling him the virgin killer or the incel king. Uh, a lot of people were saying he's a loser, he's a virgin. What a, you know, what words such as, um, actually, no, some I'm not even going to say. Basically, comments of people trying to explain why these acts happen, which in my judgment completely takes our focus and attention away from getting to the actual bottom of why each and every year more and more young men and boys are committing harm to themselves and others. And so rather than just putting it down to the boys and men taking their lives as being virgins or losers, why don't we instead look deeper into their minds so that we may be able to discover what is actually causing this crisis of connection? And who better to do that with than with Dr. Niobe Way, who throughout this interview shares her findings from 30 plus years of research, along with what she has found to be the solution to helping boys and men avoid going down these dark and harmful paths. G'day guys, Brandon Clift here from the Mankind Project and I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Boyson Hodgson, the Marketing and Communications Director of the Mankind Project. And we'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Mankind Podcast. 
where each and every week we prove to you that truth and vulnerability equal power and that the outdated models of manhood that we've been raised under aren't stuck in the way that we have to raise our boys and the next generation. There are actually more than just one way to be a man. And we love proving that to you with awesome interviews with fantastic guests. And so to tee up our guest today, I'd like to hand it over to Boyson and we will get this interview discussion jam underway. Thank you so much, Brandon. Good to be here. And I am super excited and happy and and proud actually to welcome Niobe Way. Niobe is a, a developmental psychology researcher and a professor at NYU. She has over 30 years of developmental psychology research with boys and adolescents. And uh, she's also the founder of the Project for the Advancement of Our Common Humanity and the author of Deep Secrets, Boys, Friendships, and the Crisis of Connection. Niobe, thank you for hanging out with us for a while today. Yeah, and uh, I'm super excited about it. Boys, I've read your work for a long time, so that's, this is great. I'm, I'm honored. So we're going to start with, so first of all, 30 years of research. And I've, you know, I've got your book, I've watched your TED talk, but most of our audience probably has not. So give us a download on what it, what have you learned in working with boys? Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled that you asked it that way, because that's really how I frame it, is I've learned a lot. Um, And uh, uh, everything I think nowadays has based on what I've learned from listening to boys for 30 years. So it's, it's, the story starts off, of uh, they tell a story, really. Um, and the story starts off uh, with me as a high school counselor in the late 80s, um, working in high school with, with teenage boys and um, realizing that what they wanted to most talk about in our counseling sessions was their friendships. Um, and so even though I expected them to talk about their girlfriends or their moms or their teachers, what they really want to talk about their friendships and struggling to have fine good friends and struggling to you know, connect or getting, feeling betrayed by a guy friend um, or having a really good friendship. And, um, and I realized that in the late 80s that nobody was talking about that. Everybody was kept on saying friendships were kind of things that girls wanted and boys wanted action-packed friendships and girls wanted talk friendships. And that's not what the boys and the, the teenagers in the late 80s were telling me. So I became obsessed in my research when I beca- finally became a professor in 1995 I became uh, uh, obsessed with actually uh, doing research on looking at boys' friendships and looking what, you know, what happens during adolescence. And so I'm a developmental psychologist, which means I study the same boys over many years. So I'll start interviewing them, let's say, when they're 11 or 12, and I'll interview them until they're about 18, 19 years old. And they tell a story, and it, it has five parts to it, actually. And the first part of the story they tell in their, in their friendship narratives, when I ask them about their friendships, is um, how much they want these friendships desperately um, and how much they want intimacy and, and shared secrets and to be able to tell their thoughts and feelings to and to be able to be vulnerable if they feel vulnerable and not be laughed at and wanting the connection and wanting to be able to share everything they really think. And, and oftentimes having those friendships when they were 12, 13 friendships in which they really, really trusted and felt very connected to. Um, You know, you have quotes like, uh, you know, it's someone that you can can share your heart with. It's someone that you can, you would feel lost without. Um, You know, I don't know, I would go wacko if I didn't have my friends, I'd go crazy. Uh, I need my best friend to be able to talk things out. So it's very focused on talking things out and sharing my feelings. And then as as boys got older, um, you know, remember, it's the same boys every year. So as as you got older, the very same boy that talked about, you know, I can't live without him. He's, you know, I feel lost without him, without my best friend. Two years later, when he's about 15 or 16, you start to hear a very different message. Boys start to sort of become either there's two routes that that, that I heard. One was they would start to sort of say, I don't have any friends or they're not as close anymore. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Whatever. Uh, You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of work to do. I don't have time for that. Or they would say, they would talk about a sort of yearning for a, a lost friendship when they were younger and how hard it is to hold on to their friendships as they're expected to man up. Um, and then, you, of course, you had young men who, who were able to hold on to their friendships through time. And I'll talk about why I think that's the case. Um, so you had those three patterns generally. Um, and then, as, you know, a lot of these boys get older. 
they start talking more explicitly about the sadness and the sense of isolation of losing these close connections and wanting to find these close connections and not finding other guys who, who want the same thing. Oh, they, they think that's the case. That's not the case, but they always think that. And then as you, you know, right at the time you hear this lost voice and what's incredible to me is it's right at the time that you begin to, uh, suicide rate among boys goes up dramatically. So the, the minute you hear in their language, you know, this sense that, um, of sort of what I call checking out, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, whatever, or the sort of sadness in their voice around the loss of friendships. That's exactly when in this country, the suicide rate goes up. That's when the mass, all those school shooters that we read about, yeah. they're all between the ages of 16 and 25, basically. It's all exactly starts around the age where you start to see that loss. And I've also read journals of boys who've committed suicide, which is very hard to read, of course. And they, they talk explicitly about the, lo the loss of friendships and the feeling like they'll never find someone who really understands them. Um, and then the, the, the sense of deep, deep depression over never finding that. Uh, there's examples of the, you know, the manifestos that school shooters uh, sometimes produce, like Elliot Rogers and UC Santa Barbara. That is an entire manifesto about how once he reached the age of 14 and 15, the isolation was too intense for him. And he started to feel himself go crazy from the isolation and the yearning for, boy, for male friendships. And then by the time he's 19, you know, he shoots a lot of people and shoots himself. Um, but you just see the whole trajectory of how, you know, masculinity and the pressure to man up uh, really, really hurts boys in, in terms of what they want. So, you know, I'll, I'll stop for a second. I'll, I'll allow you to ask questions, but just that's two parts of the story, sort of what they, they tell us the story, the first part being what they, who they are as human, right? Mm -hmm. They want relationships like all humans do. They want closeness, just like all humans. And then what gets in the way is really culture and masculinity in particular, that what gets in the way of our humanity and leads to what I call a crisis of connection uh, that boys have, and it's, it's pervasive, it's around the globe, a crisis of connection that has consequences, which is the fourth part of the story, which is the violence, right? The consequence of the crisis of connection is violence that boys show us through suicide and through killing other people and other forms of violence. And then finally, they tell us the solution, Boyson, which is just so important. We got to go back to those 12 year old narratives, you know, the 13 year old. The solution is helping them have the connections that they seek, to helping them have the friendships that they seek. So that is the solution uh, to, to male violence, to all sorts of problems. It, the solution is to helping young men and men have the relationships that they're starving for. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's fantastic to me that the boys tell us this whole, you know, five part story implicit in their narratives over time. It's, just, it's gorgeous to listen to because it's so clear. It's like they're shouting at us from, you know, they're shouting to the adults up there saying, what's wrong with you people? You know, I'm telling you what I want and you're making it really hard for me to find what I want. Because the adults had a, di had a different narrative, had the same narrative as well, right? That, that uh, switch point, that disconnection I, point from exactly, boyhood exactly. to manhood. No, but I, that's exactly right. I mean, I mean, basically, I wrote a paper a long time ago called uh, Is Growing Up Good for Your Health? And the answer was no, uh, because basically we, we, we grow up and, you know, there's a beautiful quote in uh, John Hughes' uh, coming of age movie from the early 1990s says when I when I one of the characters says when you grow up, your heart dies. Um, and I just think it's exactly the kind of culture, you know, it's in this uh, in this Western American culture with hyper masculinity, you know, all over the place. Um, you, your heart does die when you grow up because you're told to be, to not be, you know, to not wear your heart on your sleeve, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're told to hide your vulnerable emotions. That's your heart, mm -hmm. you know, metaphoric, obviously. But the point is, is that that is your heart. Um, and you're, you're told not to, not to express those kinds of childish kind of emotions. Um, and that's, that's a human desire and a human capacity. And it's, it's, yeah. it's wildly dehumanizing. It's wildly dehumanizing. Um, to do to boys. And of course, we do it to girls and women, too, because we live in a masculine culture. Uh, but obviously, boys and men get, get the pressure much more intensively than girls and women. Now, previously, um, Naomi, we, we've spoken with uh, Tony Porter and yeah. interviewed him on his work with A Call to Men and how he explained the man box 
how yeah. boys are generally raised with this notion of the man box is don't be a girl, don't be weak, right? Yeah. Be, uh, be as heterosexual as possible. Anything that isn't heterosexual is wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I want to, I want to hear from your research and your lens of what you believe also has contributed to this switch, right? Where boys go from loving their best friends and, and yeah. go crazy without them to then distancing themselves from them. Well, it's, it's very simple. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it's very simple. And again, you know, I, I want to underscore boys, as we had talked about earlier, this is not my opinion. This is what boys actually tell me, yeah. you know, is that, um, is that uh, they say directly, you know, we are a culture that's taken what is human. Boys tell me this directly again, that has taken what is human and given it a gender. So we've taken feeling as, as female and thinking as male and, and somehow given fundamental things we all think and feel because we're human, that's one of the capacities of humans. Um, and then we've gendered it and we've sexualized it. And in and, and many cases, we've also raced it and classed it and all sorts of things about basic human capacities. So, and, and when you race in a culture, you know, that essentially makes you go against your nature, mm-hmm. <laughs> we shouldn't be surprised that, that, you know, boys, young men and boys and, uh, you know, and, and, and adult men can go crazy in that culture because essentially they're being raised to go against their nature. And their nature is to be th- uh, thinkers and feelers to want relationships, to want, want to be social, to want to be vulnerable, to want to be connected. Vulnerability is necessary for connection, as both of you know. Mm-hmm. So you can't be deeply connected if you're not vulnerable. If you're raised in a culture that says, if you do that, you're not a man. Mm-hmm. It's like I, I always say to women, what, what would it feel like? And, and women do feel this way sometimes. But, uh, but I think that less obviously so. If, they, if, if women were told, you know, if you think you're not a woman, you know, if you think, you know, don't uh-huh. think, don't think, you know, you're not a woman. If you think, you can't think. Um, and what that would do to women and women always laugh when I give that example. But I'm saying, but that is essentially what we're doing when we say don't feel. Because if you feel, you're not a man. Uh, and of course, I mean, I mean, vulnerable feelings. I'm not talking about anger. We allow anger among men. Um, but we don't allow any kind of, uh, you know, more softer vulnerability. But the, but the idea is, is, is you got to go back to the story that I think is oftentimes missed that my research really underscores um, is that it's not just that boys suffer from a masculine culture that, that, that dehumanizes them, but you got to hear that. You got to remember those 12 and 13 year old boys that are telling us the solution by saying, I wasn't born that way. You know, I wasn't born being emotionally stoic and not wanting relationships and, you know, being whatever, you know, wanting to be only focused on competition and autonomy. I was actually born a very different way. (laughs) You know, I was born in relationship. I was born openly expressing emotions, as we know from all five-year-old boys, you know, seven-year-old boys, nine-year-old boys, lots of crying going on, lots of emotional expression. Same with 12-year-old boys, 13-year-old boys. And it just starts to shut down. So as long as we have the developmental data that shows they're not born that way, then you have to ask what's going on. Uh, and to your question, Brandon, it's the culture. They get initiated into culture. It's a masculine, you know, patriarchal culture that says, I'm going to take something that is human and, and slice it with a gender lens. And then, you know, and that's making you half human. I mean, you know, essentially it's asking boys and men to be half human and girls and women, of course, to be half human, too. But in the, in the opposite side. Um, so it, it just it, it, to me, it's an obvious, uh, Brandon, in terms of why boys suffer from that um you know girls would suffer even more if they were told so explicitly you know don't think uh because then you're not the gender that you think you are um and so i I just think it's it's really brutal and and um vicious when you see i have to tell you one story um to remind us what boys sound like Mm -hmm. and in this case it's a story of my son but um I, we, you hear it in Judy Chu's work too for, with young boys. So at five, Judy Chu wrote a beautiful book called Becoming a Boy. Um, and uh, she talks a lot with little kids, little boys. And uh, they say very similar things like this to her and to their parents. So my son at five, Raphael, um, I was going through a very difficult divorce. And um, I was trying to sort of not be sad at home because I didn't mm. want Raphael to be sad. 
Mm -hmm. you know, all the time in my household. Mm -hmm. So I came home one day from work and I came around the, uh, the door and he's sitting at the kitchen table eating something. And I said, hi, Raphael, how are you? How was your day? With a big smile. And he looked at me within a second, within one second. This is five year old. And he said, mommy, why do you smile when you're feeling sad? And, you know, and it was just like, oh, my God. He was literally saying, why are you faking an emotion? Mm -hmm. And I thought, that is what boys are like. That's what humans are like. They're incredibly astute emotionally. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was literally asking me why I fake emotions. And I, he's five years old. Wow. And he got that, that that smiley face was not actually how I felt. Um, and that's the question we should all be asking ourselves. Why do we fake emotions? Right. Why do we do that with each other and not actually reveal our vulnerability? Um, so I just that's a story, not something special about my son, but really about that's what boys sound like, you know, even at five years old. And, it's, and then they grow up to sound very differently. And what's the difference? The difference is that they weren't being pressured to man up at five years old so they can openly express what they think. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I just want to throw out there, which I think <laughs> is a super important point, when you do this work for so long, it's, you have lots of stories. Um, but, um, you know, it's not just about allowing boys to cry and allowing boys to have sad emotions and, you know, allowing boys to have, you know, close friendships. It's really recognizing the extraordinary emotional acuity that boys and young men have and mm -hmm. that, you know, the remarkable ability to read each other's emotions, to read their mother's and father's emotions, to, you know, to speak it out. My son also, he's now 20 years old. I remember him saying when he was 16 that he had a whole insight. And this is a guy who plays soccer. He's a very sort of masculine kid on the, on the outside in terms of stereotypically, but he's a soccer player. He's a, you know, that's his, his whole life is soccer. And he, at 16 years old, he came to me and said a beautiful insight about why, you know, what was happening in our whole family dynamic between my parents and my siblings and me. And, and he had this entire psychological analysis about what was going on and why we were having conflict and all sorts of things. And this is the kid, and he just announced it, that he said he understood now the whole family dynamic. And I thought, you know, again, you know, this is exactly like my research, which is that these boys are just remarkably astute about the emotional world. And that, and that to me should be celebrated. You know, that, that, you know, it's not just about crying is my point. It's about, you know, gorgeous insights about the human world that come from listening to boys. I mean, it's just stunning. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing the stories. Uh, as you were, as you were dropping in, I was asking, okay, so why do we then tell the stories? Why does culture tell the stories it tells about boys? And I was looking back on you know, my parents got divorced when I was 10. Yeah. That was my early adolescence. And then looking yeah. at my high school experience with male teachers and looking at all of these things. And there was some part yeah. of me that recognized if I express what I'm actually feeling in these situations, I'm going to be yeah. making my dad uncomfortable. My mom, if yeah. I start telling the truth about what's happening. So I just went. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I think I think I go back to my story about women. I mean, you know, if you're being told you're not you by doing something, right? You're not a man, you know, if you do this, you're not mature if you do this. Because remember, we also think emotions is childish, right? Yeah. We don't just think it's gay and girly, we think it's childish. Right. So if, if you if you show emotion, you're also being weak, childish, lame, gay, you know, and in and a misogynist culture as well, uh, you know, girly. I mean, you know, the, the whole thing is it's all the worst insults you could uh, you could imagine as a young boy in a, in a culture that right is homophobic and all those yeah. kinds of things. So, you know, I mean, it just it shouldn't be mysterious to us, you know, why boys and you wouldn't say anything because otherwise, what the culture is saying is you're not you, <laughs> you know, you're not you. You're you're actually just a a whiny, you know, uh, little child that you know can't pull it together. Right. Um, and so, and, and that's shameful. That's, that caused a lot of shame. I mean, Jim Gilligan writes a beautiful uh, book about shame and how much the root of male violence is shame. Um, and I think it's the shame of, of, of 
boys and men's own emotions. And then they feel right. They feel shame from it. They feel shame from it. And that leads to tremendous rage. Yes. Because shame, you know, shame in this world definitely leads to rage, particularly for men. Yes. Beautiful. So, so here, here's the question that I want to ask on behalf of myself when I was a kid, when I was younger. Yeah. yeah. So I, my dad got involved in, in transformational men's work when I was about nine years old. Up to that point, we had a very challenging relationship. And after he did the work, you know, our relationship grew stronger. But then all of a sudden, the narrative in the household changed to, you know, not so, I wouldn't say so much it was the machismo, don't show emotions, but it wasn't spoken about at least. And the messages yeah. I was receiving at school was, you know, private or boys school. I mean, that's just the, the, the cesspool of toxic <laughs> nursing yeah, messages, yeah, yeah. right? If you didn't play rugby or, or rowing, you, right. you, were, you weren't right. on top of the pecking order. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I had a father at home who was saying, it's okay to cry. It's okay to be emotional, right? It's okay to show your feelings. Then I would go to school and then I would show my emotions. I would show my feelings. And then I would subsequently get beaten up, subsequently yeah. get called gay or a yeah. sissy or a girl, and then yeah, come home right. crying, confused, yeah. really confused. And so the question that I want to ask for me as a future, you know, becoming a parent in the future, as well as yeah. something that might close a loop, a loop for me in my life is how, what are some practical tools that we can use or utilize yeah. to nurture our children through this phase, through this transition? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 I, and I'm really glad you asked that question because it allows me to say something that is rarely said. We have to, in, in, a, in a culture that's so individually focused, where we see problems and we individualize it. We always think it's the problem of the individual. So if someone is struggling, someone gets bullied, we, we send them to a therapist. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with being in therapy and I'm not, it's not a critique about therapy, but the point is that that's all we do. You know, we, we, we see something still, you know, someone's struggling in some ways. We say it's a mental health problem rather than why are they having a mental health problem, <laughs> right? We just say it's a mental health problem. We start yes. with the problem rather than actually what the root cause is. If we understand that basically all problems, and it sounds a little simplistic, uh, but I believe it in terms of the data, um, is that all problems are stemming from a sense of disconnection from the self or and or other, right? So that the, that disconnection from the self and others leads to mental health problems, alcoholism, you know, all sorts of individualized problems, but they're not individual problems. They're cultural problems. They're again, being raised in a culture that clashes with our nature. So if you see it as a cultural problem, Brandon, then the whole culture has to change. So what, and that's not, a, it's not a tall order because we change the culture all the time. You know, we go from Trump to Bush, I mean, sorry, from Obama, you know, Bush to Obama to Trump. Um, and so we're changing the culture all the time. We, we have gay marriage. Gay marriage, in my opinion, went, you know, happened within like a five, I know it didn't happen within a five-year period, but it felt like the Democrats didn't support it, you know, one, one year and then five years later, all of a sudden it was a, a right. So we change the culture all the time. So parents, it's very important that we begin to figure out ways to change the school culture, change the conversation. And then this is the key part, normalize the desire. And I'm going to tell you one more story because it's very, very powerful. So I work with seventh grade boys. I still work with seventh grade boys. I, I'm in schools almost every week and even these days online with students uh, every week. And um, uh, I said they read some part of Deep Secrets, a bunch of seventh grade 12 year old boys in an all boys school. And uh, they started giggling and reading the quote because the quote was very emotional and, you know, tender and, and sweet. Uh, and so they all started laughing and I knew why they were laughing because I've been around boys my whole life. So I knew why they were laughing, but I wanted them to articulate it. So I said, why are you laughing? What's so funny? And they said, you know, they wouldn't tell me. Uh, and I said, no, come on, come on, tell me what, what's so funny in this quote. And then finally, you know, one of the kids said, you know, the dude sounds gay. And I said, well, let me tell you something. And they're all listening. You know, they're 12 years old. Get imagined, you know, they're all listening. And I said, I didn't ask about sexuality in my interviews because that, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in friendships. And I said, but I just got to tell you that 85% of the teenagers I've talked to over 30 years, which is about over, you know, thousands of boys at this point, 
sound like that at some point during their teenage years. Mm -hmm. And there was total silence. Mm -hmm. And then one of the boys said, for real? And I said, oh, yeah, that's what teenage boys sound like. That's what they sound like. And get, can you guess what happened? Can you guess what happened in the, in the classroom? Then it's the hands start to go up in some way, right? Exactly. Yeah. They all wanted to share their stories of friendship. They all wanted to share their yeah. tender stories of friendship. And in fact, one boy even said to the boy sitting next to him, we used to be friends, but we broke up because he hurt my feelings. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was said in a classroom of 22 12-year-old boys. And, and all I did at that moment is all I did, I did one intervention and it took me one minute to do. Mm. I normalized what their, what their feelings were. I just normalized it. Yeah. And once they knew it was normal, then they were willing to talk about it. We spent an hour talking about their friendships mm. because all of a sudden I just said, this is normal to sound like this. And, you know, so I'm just saying as parents, you got to normalize it. You got to talk about your own friends. It's your desire for friendships. You got to, you got to, you know, go to the school and figure out ways to talk to the teachers about how normal it is for boys to want friendships and girls to want friendships. How can the school help them build friendships? Don't just yeah. focus on, you know, the kids are being bullied. You got to focus on that. Um, but, but you have to think bigger. You have to think broader. You have to think richer. That it has to be, how do we create a school environment in which, boy, in which boys and girls are not feeling isolated and lonely and you know, disconnected in some ways and, and feeling the need to cry, quite frankly, you know, Brandon, like, mm -hmm. let's create a school environment in which you don't feel the need to cry. Um, and so the idea is that think of it bigger than yourself, think bigger than your kid, bigger than yourself. Um, and so it's a matter of spreading the word, normalizing it. And then very concretely, I say this to everybody, it's just so easy to do. Talk about your own friendships with your, your mm -hmm. kids, the teachers, Teachers can talk about their friendships. Yes. Teachers can have kids talk with other kids about their friendships. They could do dyads. They could interview each other about their friendships. They could do all sorts of things in English class. They could read, you know, whatever they're reading, Tom Sawyer or whatever they're reading, and then talk about the desire for friendships in there. They could bring in social science into the classroom, right, and have boys and girls talk about these issues together. I mean, it's so effing easy. It is so effing easy because all it is is just I had a room full of 160 boys from seventh grade, sixth grade, sixth grade, sixth grade to eighth grade, the most awkward age of boys, right? 160 in the room. And all I did, all I did, and I, actually, I think it was fifth grade to eighth grade. So super awkward, right? Um, all I did was I, I put quotes on the board, right, for this whole group of boys, 150 and I basically had boys raise their hand and tell me what the quote meant. So they all started to have a conversation about the quotes from teenage boys that were collected in my research. Mm. And then they, they would raise their hand and then I would say, well, interpret the quote. And they would say, well, what he means is that you really want this and I, you really want this and your guy friends. And so that by the end of the conversation, when they were interpreting the quotes from the deep secrets, um, that all of a sudden, a, a man, you know, one of those fifth grade boys raised his hand and he said, uh, ma'am, I just want to ask you, you know, how do you find a friend? And then you had all these eighth grade boys raising their hand to try to help the fifth grader yes. understand yes. how do you make a friend? Yes. And because we're in a New York context, one of the eighth grade boys immediately said he can't be a Yankees fan. Uh, so, you know. <laughs> Uh, right. And then all the boys are laughing, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, is that, but then they made it really serious. Then the, then the, the eighth grade, the two cool eighth graders stood up, you know, he had dreads, uh, you know, he had dreads and he was super, you know, handsome kid. And he stands up and he talks about how challenging it is to find a close friend, but it's worth it. And you got to just be persistent. This is in front of 150 kids. And, you know, and the cool kid says that. Right. And you can just see all the all the other kids, you know, just sopping it up. Um, and then all of a sudden they go out in the world and they think, oh, this is this is this is, uh, you know, this is normal. This is normal. Um, and, you know, that lady, <laughs> that white lady told us so because she's interviewed a lot of boys. Um, and so I just think that whole sense of normalizing, we can't underestimate how much we can do that. And then just creating opportunities to talk about it. Um, 
you know, I, I think the other thing I just want to throw out there, because I think this is another thing that parents deal with a lot, too, and teachers do, too, but I think parents, is also helping your kid not just have a friend, but but figuring out who's a good friend, who's not a good friend, making good choices in friendships, making sure it's a mutual friendship, not just a one-way friendship, you know, making sure that you're there for them as much as they're there for you. And that's a more complicated conversation, and I would say those things could be like if we think it's complicated to be in a marriage it's amazing to me that we don't think it's complicated to be in a friendship it is right. so you know you you need guidance with that so having places in school to have sessions to talk about how to keep a friend you know how to make good choices in your friendships you know not just how to apply to college <laughs> but also like how to how to make good choices in your friendships and by, and you could do it through getting all the p- people who play soccer or getting all the people who, you know, are in the theater group. I don't care who it is, but use those natural groups in school to have conversations. I now consult with all these soccer teams, uh, with coaches, soccer coaches, about how to encourage friendships on the team. Uh, mm. And so we, I have huge soccer organizations that are investing funds into figuring out how do you have, encourage young boys and older boys to, in fact, really connect with each other. Uh, not just through soccer, but actually outside of soccer, because mm-hmm. um, they're dealing with a lot of uh, suicide and you know a lot of organizations that deal with teenage boys are dealing with all sorts of mental health problems. So, um, so I just think that it's it's just as my as my sister would say, you know, easy peasy. But we just got to do it. We just got to do it. Yes, and, and step at a time. I'm reminded of our our mutual friend Mark Green's relational work. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yep. That that kind yep. of and that becomes kind of the foundation for the healing that's healing the crisis of disconnection, healing this crisis of connection that we have all around yeah. us. So yeah, now I want to I'm going to fast forward us to yeah. uh, who the Mankind Project ends up running into. So yeah. then they get to 18 and then they get to 25 and then they get to 30. Brandon was a baby when he did the work. So, you know, he doesn't really count in this, but most of the guys who walk through the door now they're 35 years old 40 years old and what do we do with them the same exact stuff that you're talking about i know good it's like hey man you feel shame that's okay who else in the room feels shame yeah yeah you have stuff that's pent up inside you have you know bad choices you have belief systems you have all of these things right and then yeah yeah and then these men, these men who continue to kind of do this work, then we can begin to model that in a way yeah. for for those around us, right? Exactly. And I, and I would also say, I would really recommend you also, you know, bring in 12 and 13 year old boys to mm-hmm. talk to your, your men about their friendships. I mean, you know, there's something beautiful about when, when I get these older men, I get, you know, the whole age range, but especially men over 40, um, when they listen to the quotes from Deep Secrets, it's always incredibly emotional for them, dads, you know, coaches, mm-hmm. because they see themselves in those boys. Yes. Um, and they remember that time. And they remember it's not just that they're suffering now, that they had this, for some, they had this when they were younger. And if they didn't, that they knew that they wanted this over their lifetime. So this yes. connecting, connecting men who are so struggling in so many ways with young men, right, who are so connected to their emotions and able to articulate it, it would be a beautiful dialogue, you know, to get yeah. even, I would even say 12 year olds, get a group of 12 year old boys to come in and talk about their friendships, mm. right? And then just have the, have them be your panel. You know what I mean? Of 12 year old boys, you're, you're the interviewer, right? You're interviewing all 12 year old boys. They're talking about their friendships. The thir- I would say maybe 13, 14 is a little bit easier. So 13, 14 year old boys talking about their friendships. And then and then you have the audience be the men in your in your organization because you gotta learn from the young people because they say it so directly. You know, mm-hmm. they, they don't bullshit. You know, they, yeah. they're not going around the circle, they're just saying it. And there's a beautiful young man, uh, Vinny, who's been in my study forever. And he was on the Today Show a while ago talking about, you know, his whole friendship trajectory since he was younger, he's now, I think, 25. Um, And he started off uh, getting exposed to my work when he was 14 uh, or 13. And 
and he's, you know, he tells a gorgeous story and he always gets all the men in the room to cry because he tells the story of his own, you know, of his own friendships and they all connect to it. And then again, it's another way of normalizing it and also allowing the young men to be the models too, right? So that they're modeling things for the older men, which is disrupts the whole, right? Disrupts the whole thing. Cause it's yes. really the older men that are messed up and the younger men who are less messed up. Um, and so, you know, just allowing that intergenerational thing to happen, but reverse it, you know? Um, I, lo I love this, uh, this idea that the learning doesn't just come from a top down approach, right? Yeah. That it goes back yeah. up. And I think this is a, a great moment to mention our, our friends at boys to men, you know, yeah. inc incredible. Oh, excellent. Right. Yeah. Of course. Incredible yeah. organization where, where young boys yeah. are given a chance at a proper rite of passage uh, and, and led yeah. by men that are involved in men's work. And I've spoken yeah. to men that have done those weekends. I haven't done one myself yet, but they yeah. hear, you know, I say it must be amazing That's to pass on thing. such great lessons to these kids. And they go, no, they're passing them on to us. I know, I <laughs> know, I know. Us. No, but, but that's, <laughs> career i mean my whole career is everything that comes out of my mouth i learned from listening to young people from 12 year old you know 11 12 to 18 19 i mean everything that comes out of my mouth is from listening to what they've taught me and so it's that whole sense as a developmental psychologist you know we think as you get older you get smarter <laughs> that's because it's only the adults telling the story uh you know no in fact you know <laughs> yes. you know I, and everybody always laughs voice when i say that but it's true we think we get smarter as we get older because we're the one creating the theory. So we think we're smarting. But when you hear that five-year-old boy saying, mommy, why are you smiling when you're sad? That's the most emotionally astute thing you could say. And you, you wouldn't get that necessarily as an adult saying that. No, when are you asking as an adult, why do you fake an emotion? Right? We don't ask that of each other. <laughs> or we expect it and reinforce it, right? So again, yeah. back to yeah. man box culture and, and kind of, all of us who play the game of, hey, I'll yeah. pretend I'm okay if you'll pretend that you're okay for me. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, the other thing I, I just also want to add to the, the men question, Boyson, because it's an important yeah. one to me, is also um, realizing that men buy into their own stereotypes. So another thing that would be very important in these groups that you run and the, and the ways in which you work with men is, is yes. to also just remind them, again, the point I was making earlier about how emotionally astute they are naturally that yes. naturally they have incredible emotional and social skills and that's a natural phenomenon and so it's not like they have to relearn things they don't have to relearn it you know they already know it it's that just is... a matter of them of them taking the risk and using those natural skills but it's really reinforcing that it's not about you know they're emotional idiots and now they have to go back to school it's like, no, they just have to actually connect to their natural capacity um, to listen, to take something in, to process it, you know, to read emotions, to connect to people deeply. Like, I get men all the time telling me, you know, well, how do you connect to other people? And I'll say, well, how do you think? You know, what do you, how do you think you connect? Well, and then I'll start telling me and I'll say, hey, that sounds great. You know, so, so do it. You know, um, but, but it's just interesting. We do this thing called the listening project um, where we train people in what we call transformative interviewing. And we're doing it at NYU actually with faculty and administrators and graduate students and undergraduates now. It's incredibly exciting. We have 600 people on our wait list to take the listening project. And actually, Boyson and Brandon, you both should take it. I'm going to send you information on it. You would love it. Great. And it's a, it's, a, it's a whole workshop about learning how to listen, but it's about learning how to listen through asking curated questions and really using your curiosity, Brandon, you know, to really come to know somebody through your curiosity. And I remember teaching it, I was teaching it in Ethiopia uh, with teenagers and others. And I remember one of the boys said to me, um, you know, uh, I think he called, I don't remember what he called me. A lot of my students call me ma'am or miss or whatever it is. Uh, and they said, he said, miss, you know, you're really teaching us how to have friends. And he said, I'm going to use some of the things you're teaching me to try to make better friends with the other guys in my school. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm teaching you. <laughs> but, but I call it, you know, I call it a, you know, a workshop on, on um, learning sort of journalism skills. I, you know, I try to make it so that it sounds uh. more fun, you know, more fun than, than listening. 
Um, but, but the idea is that they're really just learning skills to engage with each other. They already have, but they're, you know, but they're learning that actually you can ask people questions from your natural curiosity and become close to them. Yes. So I, I just think it's, it's that men have lost touch with it. The, they believe in their own stereotypes, basically. They believe in their own stereotypes. Um, and you got to disrupt that whole process. We buy into the stories that we were told, and then we keep repeating them to each other. Yes. And then exactly. in, in, in almost everything and everything that we do in the Mankind Project, one of the key things that we do for even from the very first introductory kind of online courses is breathe into your body, feel into your body. What is your body to reestablish that connection, reestablish the somatic connection, yeah. reestablish breath, yeah. reconnect yeah. here to here. And now, and then some of the most profound work we see done arises from that question. Well, what does that yeah. wise part of you know to do now? Exactly, exactly, exactly. No, I, I'm always stunned by, I have to say, because, you know, I now, I'm now working with faculty and I'm now working with grownups at the moment uh, to, to do the listening project. And um, I'm just stunned by, you know, I'll have a lot of men in my workshop, like it'll be half men or something, more, sometimes more than half men. Uh, the group is, uh, is people uh, who are men. And, um, and I'm just always amazed that I will, you know, Boyce and I will make my own stereotypes that the women are going to be more forthcoming, that the women are going to be more comfortable with vulnerability, that the women are going to do this and that. I spend my whole life disrupting that stereotype, but I'll still hold it when I'm running a workshop. Oh yeah. And then sure. I will every, every single time I'll be proven wrong. Like every single time I will have men throughout the workshop and granted it's a biased sample because they're coming to my workshop, of course. But, right. but the point is, is that every single time I will have men as well as women, you know, I start off similarly boys and I have them do breathing exercise and getting your body exercise, you know, center themselves relax, move their shoulders, you know, I mean, get all present. And then we engage in this work for a solidly long period of time. And I just have men making amazing insights and observations about themselves and about each other and about other people in the group and women making them and women and men talking together around this. I mean, it's just, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. And I just thought how amazing that even the people who do the work voice in and, and uh, Brandon, I say this directly to you, how often, even though we do this work, we buy into these stereotypes, mm -hmm. you know, in ourselves and with each other and how much we have to be conscious of that. Um, and so that we, we offer opportunities to break it open, you know? Lovely. That's Very awesome. nice. So go ahead, Boyson. No, you, you're up. Uh, so, so I, I want to ask you a question. Um, obviously the, yeah. the, the past year, 2020 into 2021 has yeah. been an interesting time in history yeah. for all of us on many levels in different areas. I want to ask you, um, it, it's a two-sided question. You know, we know now through the data that there has been some pretty sad um, declines in, in, in the collective mental health of, of men yeah. who isolate. Yeah. Um, it's like, wow, a greater opportunity to hide. <laughs> awesome. I'm yeah. stuck at home yeah. all day. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. What is the data that's coming out right now that is scaring you the most? But on the same, on the other side of that, what are you most optimistic for as we become more aware of what's going on and as we have more of these conversations nowadays? Okay, I love these questions. I'm having so much fun. These are the great. These are great questions. These are these are cut to the heart of, of everything I do. This is fantastic. So. Um, what scares me the most, and I have had a very personal story of a, a young man who was very close with my daughter, um, who was a, like a son to me, and he committed suicide uh, two months ago. So, um, so that, that I had a very, very personal experience of, of losing someone in the last two months. And um, uh, he's a beautiful, beautiful young man. And so related to your first question about what scares me the most is just how, how off the charts the suicide rate is. I mean, the suicide rate is just literally off the charts. It's the highest number we've ever had in this country since 1941, which is right at the bit, right. It's right, right. That was right at the end of the Great Depression as we started World War II. Wow. That was a huge, huge, you know, rate of depression mm -hmm. was the highest rate since 1941. Uh, and then particularly true among boys and men, the, you know, among youth, it's gone up 57% in the last five years. Um, so it's, it's, it's just off the charts. So suicide oh. is the thing I'm most, I'm most worried about. Um, the hope, the hope 
that I have is enormous. I mean, people oftentimes will say, Niobe, you know, it's so depressing listening to you. And I was like, no, 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 you shouldn't be depressed. Because once, once you know that naturally we're not like that, mm. then that's where all the hope is. Because we can then it just then it's just a matter of changing the culture. If this was a biological fact that men actually were biologically emotionally clods and they couldn't you know they couldn't relate emotionally, um, you know then then we have a problem, right? How do we actually if something's biological then how do we actually change it? Um, I mean not that you can, you can change biology, but uh, my, you get my point. I mean yes. the point is is that it's 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 a cultural phenomenon, right? It's a cultural phenomenon, and we can change the culture. Like as I said before, we do every single t- day. We are changing the culture. We're changing our values. We never had a Black Lives Matter Me Too movement, you know, five years ago like we do now. Mm. Um, we've never had, you know, people are using the word patriarchy, you know, white mask, uh, white uh, white supremacy you know, capitalism in ways we've never used ever in the history of our country. We've never been so explicit about it. So we are changing the culture already. And you're already getting these conversations, mankind, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're already getting these conversations about men that we didn't do, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So the the, the whole point is, is that we are already changing the culture. So it's just a matter of building the movement, doing what you're doing, doing this podcast, getting people to talk about it, normalizing it, normalizing it, getting in all different walks of life. And then that creates the change. Um, and it's not going to be, you know, and I guess, I guess the other thing I want to add to that is that if we make it again, just a boy problem or a man problem, we miss the, the message here, right? We miss the message because right, it's, 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 it, it, it's a cultural, cultural. problem. Yep. That we, right, that we have created what is human and made what is human into something that's gendered and sexualized, and in many cases, raced and classed as well, right? We have, we have done, said something that is human. So as, keep it at that larger perspective. Don't make it into a boy problem. Don't make it into a man problem. Don't make it into a woman problem. You know, don't make it pitting the genders against each other. Yes. Like, no, it's a cultural problem of living in a system where we have a hierarchy of humanness and certain qualities are put on top and certain qualities are put on bottom. And then we, we, we try to raise children in that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thinking is put on top of the hierarchy and feeling is put on the bottom. And then we raise children to be human, but how can you be human in that context? So it's just always keeping the message. It's the, you know, to say this as a, you know, in a sort of loving way, it's the culture dummy. You know, like it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the person, it's not the, you know, it's not the individual, it's not the group. It's the larger culture in which they're situated and it doesn't reflect their nature. Like murderers and rapists were not born murderers and rapists. They became that way, right? Mm -hmm. They became that way. What made them a murderer or a rapist? That's the question we should always be asking. What made Donald Trump the way he is? I'm not saying he's a murderer or rapist. I'm just saying you know, what made him that way? That's the question we should be asking. Yes. He wasn't born that way. He wasn't born being so sort of uh, emotionally ignorant. He wasn't born that way. So there's a beautiful couple of thing, couple of good news, bad news things in there, right? So good news is you're off the hook. It's not your fault, men, yeah. women, any, right? It's not your fault. Yeah. Bad news, it is 100% your responsibility to, to change yeah. it. If it's something exactly. that's important to you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah. No, but boys, that's exactly my point. Yeah. And and the point is is that you should want to change it because you, because people are killing themselves and killing each other uh, if you don't change it. Yep. So oh, if the- you say to change it, then what you're saying is that it's okay for people to continue in skyrocketing rates to kill themselves and to kill other people. Yep. So we're going to get more and more school shooters. We're going to get more and more suicide. Suicide is now more common than getting hit by a car. I mean, you know, basically we're going to continue to have an incredibly violent culture as long as we continue to gender what is fundamentally human. Beautiful. So, and the big, and Brandon and I talk about this and Brandon talks about this every time he's on the podcast, the what's in it for you is you'll be happier. (laughs) You'll be more whole you'll feel more fulfilled you'll feel and and then the love and the connection that man the the feeling of being connected to another human being on the on an emotional level who's right in front of you right that 
Yeah. That is the payoff for what we what we have. And and if that sounds too daunting, if the whole culture sounds too daunting, the other key thing is microculture. You're in your how many microcultures are all of us in? Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. change my microculture like that. Yeah. 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 No, I, I'm just saying, I mean, I have, I'll, I'll give you an example. So I want to change the classroom at NYU. I don't want to teach how I used to teach. I, I, you know, ever since I started doing this work, I change how I teach. In the first five minutes of every single class I teach at NYU, I say, turn to your partner, the first five minutes of class, the very first class, I say, turn to your partner, ask them a question, and I give them the question. And the questions are such like, what do you want most in your life and why? What do you fear the most and why? Uh, you know, tell me about a favorite childhood memory. If you really knew me, you would know, and you have to finish the sentence. I, I pick one of those questions. They turn to their partner. I say, you each have three minutes to ask that question, and then turn it back around, and then we're going to begin the class. And, and they all laugh, and they think it's funny, and then they do it. You know, they interview each other both sides for three minutes, yep. and then basically we start the class, and everybody's about to cry because they cannot believe that in six minutes, they are feeling connected to the person sitting next to them. And it was that easy. It was literally yes. that easy. Beautiful. And I think, there you go. That, now the class is going to be taught. And, and they'll say, and, and then what I do is throughout the class, I, I throw in stuff like that all the time. Even if the topic is on something totally different, I throw that in because I know that I can make connections, you know, initial connections, obviously not deep connections, but initial connections very, very easily. Um, and then the students all freak out. They said, I can't believe in six minutes of the class, I feel so close to the person sitting next to me in this class. Oh, my God, I made a new friend today, and I never knew it was that easy. And I said, it's totally easy. You just have to have the, you know, you have to scaffold at Boyson. And Boyson and, and Brandon, I want you guys to think of yourself as you're scaffolding a human capacity and need. That's all you're doing. Beautiful. It's you're just scaffolding, right? And then you're allowing it to happen, and you're offering the scaffold. You're not teaching you're scaffolding it. Scaffolding. Um, and then that's all I do. I scaffold it. And then the students are all, all of a sudden connected. And by the end of the semester, you know, they all, they all want to stay in the class because it's now a friendship group, mm. you know, cause I, I make them switch partners throughout the semester. Right. So they get to know different people in the room. And, um, and that's a class on, you know, whatever I'm teaching that, you know, it doesn't matter what I'm teaching. I always do it. Um, and so that means like change how you do things, change how you do things. Do it with your employees in your in your organization. Do it, you know, have to start off a faculty meeting or a, a you know, a, a meeting of your staff or a meeting of your colleagues. Start off with saying, turn to your partner and ask them what do they want most in their life and why. Just start the meeting like that. There you you go. know, and then all of a sudden, right? And then all of a sudden you have people sharing things that are beautiful. Start with stories of joy because it's always fun to tell stories of joy. You know, a favorite childhood memory. You know, and then all of a sudden people are sharing these tender, gorgeous moments with their father when they were nine, you know, whatever it was, um, with each other. So do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a staff meeting. Do it in a, you know, a classroom. I mean, I don't care where it is. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, you're know, you hanging out with your buddies in a, you know, in a bar. Say, oh, let's go around the room and, and uh, you know, let's share our in. favorite childhood memories. Let's check you know in. I mean? like, right. Yes. You know, you just ask the question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Beautiful. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I think we're coming coming to the end here, and uh, so my two teenagers. I have a fourteen year old and a sixteen year old. Both now make oh, fun. Oh, good, yeah. Both now make fun of me, and also can imitate me on point with checking in because they hear me check in on every business meeting that I have in the yeah. Mankind Project. Yeah. Boys and Hodgson yeah. checking in. I'm feeling. Here's what's going on, beautiful. right? So That's there's beautiful. there's what we can do. So there there. Yeah. If you want to take one thing away from Niobe Way, wait a minute. And Niobe, just I just got to ask, is this all your opinion? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. No, it's from 30 years of research. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I and I say that explicit. I want this to be on your show. Is that? It's explicitly not my opinion, because if it was just my opinion, it wouldn't be that interesting. Um, because the whole point is, is, is this is what, and this is a beautiful way, thank you, Boyson, for allowing me to end on this, yes. is that this is exactly what boys have been telling us for, if you look at the literature, if you look at the fictional literature from Catcher in the Rye uh, to the research done in the early part of the 1900s on farm boys in the state of Ohio, 
all the way through the 20th century, all the way through the 21st up until now, this is what boys have been telling us for over a century. They, they want deep connection. They want deep friendships. They want to be able to be uh, as emotionally as expressive as everybody else. They are emotionally astute. They want real relationships. That's Catcher in the Rye. Do you remember that book? It's all about his critique of phonies. Uh, you know, he doesn't want phony relationships. He wants genuine relationships. That's 1940. Uh, you know, we have known this for over a century, and we now need to act and change the culture to fit what boys and girls and non-gender conforming people want, and because they're human, and that's it. Thank you. Brandon, take us out. They're human, and that's it. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. No, we thank you so much for this time. I, I'm walking away with, uh, you know, I, I tell people this openly. I selfishly am sitting in the seat right now because I get to get psyched and mentored and coached by people that I, I, I truly admire. And also by people that I may not agree with a lot of what they're saying, but I always yeah. get a chance to yeah. learn something. And so I want to take time to honor those of you listening right now or watching live on Facebook that are, that are here to learn something. Learn something new about yourselves and learn ways in which you can get more enjoyment. Yep. Dog's learning too. <laughs> get more, uh, you know, get more out of this, this journey we call life. And uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I look forward yeah. to doing the, the intro, recording the intro for this one, because it's, there's so much juice and meat on the bone of this conversation. So thank you again for being here. Um, before we yeah. do wrap up though, how can we, excuse you, how can we support you in your research and your work oh. and your mission? Okay. Yeah, no, th thank you so much. So my think and do tank called the project for the advancement of our common humanity. Uh, the website is pach.org and you can reach out to us. You can, uh, there's all sorts of ways. We have a huge, huge group of people who volunteer or organizations that are part of our, our organization that work with closely us. We're doing all sorts of interventions across around the world, truly. Um, and we'd love your involvement in the movement. Um, we see ourselves as a movement uh, that involves lots of other organizations and powerful work. So it's pach.org. Um, and just check us out. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Fantastic. Links have just been posted in the comments and they're going to be in the show notes. For those of you that have joined us live, thank you for checking in. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, your feelings, your opinions. It's all welcome. Thank you, Boyson, for joining me today in this uh, in this awesome discussion yeah. here. And Niobe, thank you for being here as well for another discussion where we break the That's molds great. of modern manhood to prove that there is more than just one way to be a man. <laughs> as, <Buddy! laughs> that's Tabasco. That's not. Oh, buddy. that's Tabasco. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, this guy here. <laughs> it's been. Thank you, Niobe. Really been fun. Oh, thank you. That was awesome. That's totally awesome. That's awesome. totally awesome. She, that's someone, I mean, 30 years of research. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense because she didn't skip a beat that entire discussion. I, it, it was so fun. And if you're just listening, if you're just listening and didn't get to see the video that goes with this, uh, so much smiling, so mm. much nodding, so much just, just being with Niobe, being in her energetic field, whatever, you know, mm. woo woo, whatever. But being with her is just so energizing. Oh man. Cause Especially, she's so hopeful. Like there's something so optimistic underneath everything she's saying. I mean, especially when we're unveiling terrifying data, you know, up 54% in the past five years, youth suicide, like that's it, it, in, in boys. It's so saddening, but her optimism I think is what it doesn't, it doesn't wipe over it. It doesn't yeah. make, make it something to be like, Oh, but there's hope. It, you know, it's like, no, but there is so much we can do. There is so much movement right now. There is so much progress right now. But yes. how can we strike while the iron's hot right now? How can we individually become the scaffolding that can help make this normalized, these discussions normalized, that connection and friendship all throughout life is good, is healthy, is normal? Yes. And is and is 
based in research and is based in research across the social sciences, across the biological sciences, across the neurological sciences, and more and more and more, right? The yeah. evidence just keeps piling up. So, you know, the great parenting books, how to, how to talk so kids will listen and listen so kids will talk, their relationship, their relational play book by Mark Green and his partner, Saliha. Um, it's all the same thing. You don't have to argue about this with your kids anymore. You don't have to argue about this with people. It's just like, no, we're emotional beings. Yeah. Connection is what we're wired for. Yeah, absolutely. It's what we are wired for. And I believe we've proved that again in another great interview, Boyce. And thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to get to share the mic with you. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're not, we're more than six feet apart. We're not sharing an actual microphone. <laughs> But we, we're yeah, respecting the distance right now. 900 miles or something? Give or take. Give yeah. or take. 901. But uh, yeah, great to spend this time with you, man. I love, the, I love what you bring to the table. And I look forward to the next time that we create another triad discussion. You too, Brandon. Awesome you to see you, man. This has been the Mankind Podcast produced in association with the Mankind Project USA. I have been your host, Brandon Clift, and I personally want to thank our guests for joining us today and imparting their wisdom from their experiences in this amazing journey called life. And of course, I want to thank you, the listener, because through your attention and your support, you make it a heck of a lot easier for us to let men out there in the world know that they are not alone and that there is more than one way to be a man. Special thanks, of course, goes to my incredible team, Marketing and Communications Director Boyson Hodson, Producer and Editor of this episode, Michael Russo, who makes me sound so much more intelligent than I actually am, so of course, special kudos goes there. And if you've been enjoying the music throughout this episode and all of our episodes, check out Jim, Donovan, and the Sun King Warriors. I have links to them in the show notes. Now, the fee for this episode is simple. If you found gold and insights that you believe could benefit your loved ones and those you care about, be sure to share it with them. And of course, remember that life doesn't happen to us. It happens for us. So long as we rip the pen out of fate's hand and become the author of our own story. So my friend, pick up the pen and we'll see you next week. Lots of love.